Okay, uh, thank you all. I think everyone can hear me now. I think we've got everybody in the meeting who should be. Those people who are not uh, delegates, we had a number of people trying to get into the meeting, not sure again how they got the specific link. The only people who should have been in this meeting per se are the delegates. Um, and those delegates we've asked to keep their cameras off until they are actually speaking. Um, the only one other individual that's not yet in the meeting is uh, Mr. Shaw, <clears throat> excuse me, from Riverstone and we're still trying to get a hold of and see whether or not we can get him in the meeting. So, um, so thank you all uh, for joining us today for uh, everyone. I'd like to officially call this meeting to order, <clears throat> excuse me, at 9.14 a.m. Um, and uh, state this uh, meeting is an electronic meeting being held in accordance with Section 238 of the Municipal Act 2001 due to our COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to confirm that all members of council are present. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and then also we have a number of senior staff here, including our uh, Director of Environmental Services, as well as our CAO, our Acting Deputy Clerk, um, and also uh, planning staff are with us as well. So thank you everyone for joining us. And we do also have a number of delegates uh, who are going to be speaking, have asked to speak at this meeting. Again, your uh, cameras and microphones are muted now. When it's your turn to speak, we will uh, ask you to unmute uh, yourself and then also to uh, turn your video on so the public can see who is speaking. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that we are on lands traditionally occupied by the Indigenous peoples. The Indigenous peoples have cared for our territory for the benefit of future generations. Their stewardship throughout the ages is certainly recognized. Um, public input <clears throat> was invited uh, through planning at muskokalakes.ca an email. Uh, Mr. Pink, I believe we have a number of submissions that have been received. Um, I know many of those have been circulated to Council, and I will also suggest that uh, anything that uh, hadn't been circulated within the next 24 hours will be circulated coming forward. But I do know that we've all received a number of different submissions. I don't think we need to list them all at this particular time. Um, motions uh, in this meeting today are pre-populated, random movers and seconders, and we will vote by raising our hands. Also, um, I do not believe we have any uh, supplementary agenda today. There's no supplementary. Thank you very much. Um, we do have a couple of uh, invited delegations. Uh, one of them right now we're seeing if he's around to get in the meeting, and that would be uh, Mr. Shaw from Riverstone Environmental um, regarding to our boat impact assessment in Wallace Bay and that study that we all received. The second study that received was uh, from uh, Altus Group, and that was Peter Norman. Uh, regarding understanding the waterfront economy. Both of those studies as some background were provided uh, and requested through our Manette Steering Committee. And uh, some of those studies were not fully released until middle of our uh, pandemic this spring. So they were circulated to council, but uh, this is sort of our opportunity to discuss those a little bit further. Um, as our consultants really are uh, uh, going above and beyond to help us out today. They provided the report, but this is really our first chance outside of that contract to help us out. I'm just gonna start the meeting, if I may, with our uh, counselors. And regarding any of those studies that were done, uh, and I guess I'll go first of all to the economic study in particular, uh, and Mr. Norman, who's with us, and just ask council if you have any specific questions on those studies right now. Um, Oh, thank you. Uh, I did forget, but I think we're probably all good. Does any councillor have any uh, pecuniary interest today as we're moving on? I don't see any. Thank you very much. Um, but uh, does any councillor have any um, questions uh, from Mr. Norman at this particular point regarding the uh, economic study and waterfront study? Well, I'll receive the report, thank you. Um, for those public uh, looking, um, one of the largest reports. <laughs> That I think we've received here. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, very, very detailed, obviously. Um, but uh, I think, uh, Peter, I appreciate your hard work in getting us to this point and um, uh, studies as a background perspective. Um, I, I'll, I'll just turn it to you because you are here. Is there anything you wanted to say or highlight to council as we move forward regarding your study? And welcome. Well, well thank you very much for welcoming me and for having me in your meeting. 
Um, I am uh, I am at your disposal, Mr. Mayor, to the extent that you uh, want me to work through any of the study or the or the conclusions um, or or not. I mean, you uh, you pointed out the the length of the study already, but there's a there's quite a a, a good and succinct uh, summary at the beginning of it, and I'm, I hope everybody's been had an opportunity of of reviewing it. Uh, we were retained by the just by way of context, we were retained by the district. Uh, in conjunction with the steering committee to uh, undertake this study. Um, the study is all pre-pandemic. That's always an important thing to, to uh, particularly in the economic studies these days to, to put together in terms of the analysis. Uh, we quantified um, through a variety of means what we feel is the, is the sum total of the waterfront economy. Uh, and in particular, uh, trace back how it's uh, fueled by uh, visitors and, uh, and visitor accommodation. We looked at a variety of different types of visitor accommodation and looked at the economic impact from each of those types. And we did a almost 30 year projection of, uh, of need for visitor accommodation uh, in the district as a whole and on the waterfront and in the study area, which is the big three lakes uh, and have conclusions in there about the required uh, new units that may, be that may be needed over the next three decades. Uh, across the, the different types of uh, accommodation. So that's the gist of the study in a, in a, in a very high nutshell. And I am, uh, as I said at the beginning, at your disposal if you have any questions and or um, uh, need to explore anything in a little bit more detail. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you very much. I see that Councillor Jagowitz has a question. Councillor Jagowitz. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Peter, um, I'm looking at your recommendation page in the executive summary and your first recommendation, I will read, the analysis of future waterfront accommodation needs does not support the case for a new resort village in Muskoka. I wonder if you might just expand on that somewhat. Well, the, the, it, uh, the um, this is, first of all, this is not a planning study. So we're not addressing planning related issues that there would be around uh, whether designations uh, ought to be for resort village or not. Sorry, there's some interference there. And I think it's Councillor Jagwitz's uh, microphone. Maybe we'll just mute him and lower his hand. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Yep, I'll, just, okay. I'll, I'll just continue. So, so it's so ours was really kind of a quantitative or an economics uh, uh, recommendation through that piece. We felt that there was a need of well, we said 270, but let's say. Uh, somewhere between about 250 and 300 new uh, resort accommodation rooms needed over the next uh, over the forecast period, which is the next uh, three decades, and um, you know that could be in the form of a of a of one large a typical uh, a large resort, or it could be accommodated through you know the typical process of expansions of a, of a number of the existing resorts over time. Um, but the idea about setting aside planning for a resort mm -hmm. village, which might be two or more res additional resorts over that period of time, we felt that there wasn't demand for that. Um, so I think that I will temper it in from those perspectives that mine is a recommendation about quantity. Um, what we're looking at is, is, uh, is, is this kind of gradual need for additional rooms, but it's not a, uh, it's not a massive need. It's not a need of, for, for many new resorts or even for two new resorts. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Jagos, do you have a supplemental? I did, but I also wanted to apologize. Just as I spoke, uh, uh, the cleaning people decided they would clean right next to me. So I apologize for that, that noise. Yes, thanks for that explanation. And I, I do concur. As I understand your report, there's a gradual need for more units, but they could be accommodated by the existing resorts or possibly a new one, but there's no, no burning need for, for, for a, a brand new resort. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions? for um, Mr. Norman at this point. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Peter, again, thank you for uh, your hard work and appreciate uh, and even your comments just recently to Councillor Jagowitz regarding it's not really a planning study. And uh, I, I, I love data. I, I go back, I think I said this at a meeting a little while ago that um, when they built Las Vegas, I don't think Nevada said we have a need to 
kind of a bunch of accommodation in the middle of the desert. But uh, ultimately, <laughs> at the end of the day, somebody determined that uh, it was a good place to build a casino and village, and uh, it's grown exponentially. So uh, thank you for that. Thank um, you. Does anybody have any questions uh, or any comments relating to the boat impact study at this particular point? I'll come to you, Councillor uh, Zavitz, in just one moment. Um, I, and Mr. Shaw is not with us, but we can also forward those questions off. I'll go to Councillor Zavitz now. You had your hand up, or is it regarding the uh, economic study? Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, again, I'm, I'm going to speak a little more generally, if I might, just to, for terms of reference here. Um, I mean, I'm looking at the recommendation for today's uh, special council meeting. Um, there are some takeaways, expectations, certainly of today. Uh, recommendation that the draft official plan amendment uh, for the village re resort of, of Minette be circulated for public and other stakeholder comments and further that a concurrent open house and statutory. So public meetings, I, I'd like to understand if I could, sir, what the expectation of today is. I mean, if, if we are to, as a council, bless those pieces and let's move this thing on to the public, uh, having just received uh, the agenda on Friday, and then the reports that were coming through all weekend and this morning uh, of commentary, if you will. Um, I'm not so sure that we as a council are prepared at this early stage when everybody else has had this for so long to uh, to move this through. I, I do know that on June the 11th, uh, we very specifically, makes mention here, uh, passed a resolution directing uh, a draft OPA, which, um, then established a committee yourself, our planning chair, Barb Bridgman was on it. Um, we as a council have never heard back from you as our charges on this, on that whole piece. And I find myself right now in a state where I'll you know, certainly listen to everything today, but I'm in no position to put my hand up and say yes or no to very much with the same kind of fulsome opportunity that so many others have had. I almost feel unarmed here uh, to an extent, yet I know lots about Manette. And I, I guess that's my sort of general thought on this. Do, do we as a council believe we've been set up for success here? Thank you for that, Councillor Zavitz. And uh, as we were gonna get into the official OPA, um, my, my initial comments were going to be that and uh, had a conversation with Councillor Mazan this morning. Um, out of today, the idea is not that we say this is what should be or this is what shouldn't be. The concept being we want to hear um, from the public. We have a number of delegates on what is before us today. And then do we think it's okay to take this out to the public for some additional comment? Um, what I am sensing, and again, so you understand, uh, Councillor Bridgman, Councillor Edwards and myself are the only three people on our council uh, that had seen some prior stuff. There's a number of new items that have been interjected through the consultant in writing the OPA that we all uh, agreed or saw for the first time late Friday. So I don't think there's anybody who's um, in total an enlightenment that says, yes, we wanna take this and this is what we would approve as an OPA going forward. So this is for digest. Um, I think that, uh, uh, the appropriate thing would be, let's receive all the comments today. Let's sort of determine afterwards, do we want to bring this to a special uh, planning committee meeting? Do we want to bring this to council next time, depending on what other input or tweaks we want to take before this is actually put out to the public for consideration, though it is sort of in the public's eyes for consideration today as well at the same time. And hence the reason we have a number of delegates. So I hope that answers your question, Councillor Zavitz. And I see Councillor Kelly and then Councillor Bridgman want to comment. Uh, thank you. And through you, just a supplemental to Councillor uh, Zavitz's question. Um, just want to sort of put it on the record. I, my goal, my hope today is to learn a lot more than I, than I know right now. We've got uh, uh, quite a few submissions and, and, and uh, delegations to hear. Uh, we, we continue to receive inbound via email at 305 this morning 810 this morning 815 this morning um so uh, the only thing i would like to say uh, for instance on the with the last uh, commentary mr norman on the economic development study i thought it was a great study i do have questions uh, i don't want to ask them right now but i do want to reserve the right to ask them at some point in the future 
Thank you. Absolutely. And, and remember, Council, at any given time, uh, we can have a conversation. I suggest that there's a specific question regarding the economic study. Uh, have a conversation with uh, Mr. Pink and or put those in writing. And I know that Mr. Norman would be happy to answer them specifically. Councilor Bridgman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Harding. I, I just wanted to chime in too with Councillor Zavitz. I had emailed uh, Mr. Pink yesterday and copied uh, Mayor Harding and and um, Mr. Hammond uh, with exactly those thoughts, um, uh, Glenn, that I think today is to receive all of this information. And my suggestion had been that I would be happy to call a special planning committee meeting and just have it about this so that everybody can understand it because you're quite right. The only people who really have this in depth right now are Councillor um, <clears throat> Edwards, uh, Mayor Harding and myself. So that would be <clears throat> my recommendation. And um, on further talking to Mr. Pink this morning, let's get that done before the district has a look at the OPA so they know where we stand on that. So my hope would be a special meeting when then we could say we're comfortable with this heading out to the public. So I just wanted to chime in right. on that as chair of planning. Right, Councillor Jagowitz, you have a question? Oh, need to unmute yourself, Frank. Thank you. Uh, uh, no, it's not a question. I just wanted to support what has been said previously. As vice chair of planning, I do support that we have a special meeting to bring all uh, councillors up to speed before we uh, make decisions that is important as this. Thank you. Right. And again, I want to reiterate, we're not making an official decision today. Our, based on our resolution, this was to have been brought back as a draft OPA to council before the end of August. So hence the reason we're here today. Um, we could have delayed this and had some other meetings, but we were following and our planning staff were following uh, the direction of council. So hence we are here. Um, so uh, Mr. Norman, thank you uh, for joining us. I, I, I don't know, you're, you're welcome to stay in the meeting and watch where things go, uh, but I know you've probably also got a number of other things to get on with today and any uh, specific council questions like Councillor Kelly may have in the future, we will uh, get in touch with you directly. So uh, I'll say thank you and you can stay or leave as your leisure. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, perhaps if there is a need to call me back in at some point in time, you could have Mr. Pink uh, uh, email me or, or, or ask me to, to go back into the link. Absolutely, thank you thank very you. much. Okay, um, uh, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. I just want to uh, share my concern with um, somewhat of a message that I heard or received that um, councillors will be contacting people individually with their questions and answers. And I'm very concerned about that 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 should be part of a, a committee or a council meeting. Uh, I, I don't believe that we should be contacting the consultants or contacting pretty much anybody uh, to get answers to our, our own individual questions because that, that would not be, uh, in my opinion, the proper form. Other councillors may have concerns and questions. And so I, I don't believe that that should be the direction that is given to council. Okay, thank you for that. And I think my, if I was misunderstood, my comment being if uh, Councillor Kelly had a question specifically um, that would be forwarded through Mr. Pink and at which point that question is usually and answer would be supplied to the entire council so that we're all briefed on the same thing. Um, there's no individual information that one person gets that the other person shouldn't get. I agreed with that, so thank you. Um, anybody else right now or can we continue on? Okay, we'll get to Councillor uh, Nishikawa. We'll just mute your microphone. Um, we have a number of delegations today. Uh, we have uh, Paul Bustard from Cleveland South, James Lewis, Chair of Minette Joint Steering Committee, uh, Deborah Martin Downs, President of the MLA, Ian Newell, Ken Pierce, Frank Potto, as well as Paul Richards. Um, and I'm gonna ask one question, first of all, Paula, you're the uh, one lone representative of the actual developer in and around Cleveland's house. Um, and we, from a preference, we listed in the agenda, everybody alphabetically. Thankfully, you were one of those kids who probably had their name called first versus Councillor Zavitz was always at the back of the bus, so to speak. And um, so, I, but I'll ask you individually, would you like to, 
present first or, you know, as a developer, would you like to present sort of at the end of uh, everything here? So I'll leave it to you and I'm happy, whatever you'd like. Otherwise, I have, we'll no, I have no preference. So whatever works best uh, for council, but I have no preference. Um, then you know what, let's just follow the agenda. We'll go okay. through um, alphabetically if we can. Perfect. So uh, over to you, Paula. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, members of council. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you uh, today. Um, and I also want to thank you for the opportunity of allowing us to participate in the working group. It's been um, a, a very good and, and collaborative process, and, and we've enjoyed um, having lots of different discussions with the different stakeholders. Um, I think the report that came out Friday took us a little bit by surprise. There was a bunch of items that we thought we were close to resolution. I know when the working group uh, stopped a few weeks ago, not everything had been resolved, but at least it was our feeling that uh, there had been major concessions by all stakeholders and we were very close to a full resolution and, and kind of having an OPA that we could all support. Um, I believe that the document that came out Friday had a lot of new items that either had not been discussed or seem to deviate quite drastically from the joint positions around the table. And I certainly am not speaking for any stakeholder other than ourselves. Um, we obviously embarked on this uh, with the intent to come up with a, a revised policy that would be more respective of controlled, managed, sustainable, and viable developments on the Cleveland's property. Um, as you all know, the, the intent of purchasing this property was to curb uh, the development or unsustainable development on it. Um, to that extent, there's 10 major concessions that, that we felt that we had agreed to, including substantial, almost 50% reduction in the as of right permissions for number of units. We agreed to um, uh, GFA caps, gross floor area caps on the site, which have never existed before. Unit equivalencies, um, as also as use clauses, a lot of restrictions on the boating and docking. Um, these are all spelled out in a letter that we did submit this morning from our consultant IBI group. The document that was released on Friday um, surprised us, as I said, because there seemed to be new um, issues, new caps, lower percentages, uh, new phasing requirements, things that uh, we just absolutely can't support at this time. We still want to get back to the table, work with all parties. We still feel like we are very close to having a resolution that everyone could support. I just feel this, uh, this document is a departure from that. So we reiterate our support to, to work with all parties and, and to stay at the table. Uh, but right now, the document that's before us is not something that we could support uh, respectfully. So I'm happy to answer any questions, but I don't want to get too detailed on a policy by policy basis, because that has been mentioned by everyone. This just came out Friday, and I think people are still digesting the minutia of, of what's before us and all the comments that are coming in from the various stakeholders. Uh, so with that, I'll end my comments, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. But thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, yes, uh, as council realizes, there was a barrage of uh, emails uh, over the weekend. This morning, Councilor Bridgman apparently has insomnia at 3 a.m. And um, don't worry, I was up at 4 a.m. listening to raccoons in my living room once again. So um, anyway, the um, any questions specifically for Paula at this particular point or Councilor Jagowitz? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, I did have questions, but Paula was very brief. And uh, uh, I guess we're all realizing we're not going to get into details today. So I will reserve my questions for when we get into the, the, the details of the, of the proposal, which I gather will come at a later time. Thank you. Um, and, and you know, we, we can get into some details and some high level stuff as there is something flagging with council at this particular point that we are all here together as opposed to just saying, okay, let's just put a pause on this meeting. Um, is there something specific that uh, would be of interest to us all? Councilor Jagowitz. There you go. Uh, thank you. Yes, yes, there is. Um, um, I, um, I attended a, a presentation uh, where Paula was at it in October and her boss was there. And what, what I took out of that presentation was that the, the intent was to restore Cleveland's house to its sort of former glory. Uh, it was to have uh, the units wholly owned by the resort um, and, and to be just a seasonal resort. Um, uh, and, and, and with that intent, to use private services. And that seemed to make a lot of sense. But what seems to be uh, before us now is uh, a series of uh, 
owner, owner um, resort units, uh, fully residential units in a resort zone. And these are still being requested on private services. The, the current uh, uh, township official plan and district official plan it does not allow uh, uh, multi-residential on private services. It must be on public services. So that's a whole area I think we have to, to, to rectify. Just to give my personal opinion, I support the private services, but I have, I do not support uh, residential uh, uses in, 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 on those private services. If it's going to be residential, they should either be individual services, or if it's going to be multi, like a community, it almost has to be public. So, so that's the area, but we can get into more detail uh, at a later date. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure, Paul, if you, I mean, it's more of an opinion on that, if you want to comment or not, but. Um... Uh, I'll just say briefly, the, the servicing has been probably one of the, the more challenging issues that have been discussed um, by the working group and, and by uh, staff at both the district and, and um, at, at the township. The issue for us is there is a very, very substantial reduction in the as of right permissions that are being proposed, and it's just not economically viable to support a public uh, facility. Um, there's just not enough density to support it. it it's, uh, and so the issue that we're trying to do is to find some common ground here. Um, I do understand that there is a district policy that restricts uh, residential being on private services. We do think that in this case, in exchange obviously for the reduction in the density and for the controlled growth that's being proposed in the net, it could be done in a, in a meaningful and in a respectful and in a safe uh, manner. And obviously there would be a lot of uh, legal provisions and a lot of agreements that would have to be sorted through. And we do understand that that's a deviation from existing policy and, and that's been flagged from day one as being something that we'd have to work through. Uh, but again, it's just the density reduction that's being proposed would no longer support um, a municipal servicing um, as originally contemplated in the existing permissions. Um, so we will continue to work with, with all parties on that matter and, and to work through any legalities that need to be sorted through to make sure it's done in a safe manner. Thank you. Councillor Zavitz. And we'll get you on meet yourself, Glenn. Sorry, uh, to keep Paula on the, on the hot seat there. So, so Paula, I read in the Travis report, point number three, it is clear that the steering committee recommendation and approach remain dominant with concessions being made primarily by the principal stakeholder. That would be you, correct? That would be the principal stakeholder. As much as we all love Minette, you are the principal stakeholder. Um, I hear your concerns about um, your surprise or your reaction based on Friday's uh, in this negotiative dance that we're involved in, not to be flippant, yeah. Where does that put you? Where, where's your headspace now with that? Paula? Um, I mean, we've been thinking over the last few days. Um, we still remain very committed to work with all parties. I, I really do feel that um, resolution is, is obtainable and, and I think we are close. Um, I think maybe this is a product of the fact um, that, you know, we, we ended the working group without everything being resolved and it's kind of one interpretation of some of those things, uh, but it's not necessarily based on pure planning rationale. Like I know the issue of percentage of residential, you know, we were saying 50%, that's what's in the existing permissions now. I know the steering committee had recommended zero. And so in the report that was released, it said, okay, well, we'll just pick 25% because it's common ground. That's not really based on anything. Um, but our headspace is still wanting to do the right thing by the property, do the right thing for Manette, for Muskoka, and, and we're not going anywhere. We really want to work with everyone still. So, um, you know, we're still highly motivated to get this done. I, f I feel like this report's a little bit of a setback, but certainly not insurmountable. So we're in a good headspace, I think, still. Okay, thank you. Anybody else right now with Paula? Um, I, I will say it's interesting as the report came out, um, and uh, I know myself and Councillor Bridgman, Councillor Evers working through the steering committee, we, we thought we'd take two steps forward and back and forth, and there's always a give and take. The same way as on council, you know, we don't have to have uh, unanimity in every vote we do. We need a majority. And that uh, through the steering committee, we had some a lot of really good progress. Um, I said to uh, Mr. Pink over the weekend that uh, it, the one thing about this report, it's frustrated people on both sides. 
and uh, which is probably a pretty good thing, which is probably meaning that it's probably not bad. And as we continue to work our way through this, hopefully we can move forward. So uh, thank you for that. And thank you, Paula, to yourself uh, and uh, Mr. Goldhar and uh, everybody uh, who's worked on your end to move this forward. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on now to uh, Jim Lewis. Jim, we'll get you to unmute yourself and turn on your camera. There he is. Your grandson's uh, tech, IT tech support's helping you out today. <laughs> That's right. That's the only thing that got me on. But first of all, my comments are to represent the, the steering committee as a whole, as opposed to individual personal uh, positions that I might take on some of the issues that we've been involved in. And rather than getting into any individual one, I wanted to make some overview sites of what I think is happening now. So I just get into that. And this old pay amendment is the embodiment of your ideas and beliefs of what is the best way to develop the township. It lays out your concepts and sets the goals and the guidelines for achieving those goals. Your task is crafting the amendment is to set the parameters within which others may develop any given territory. As Paula has indicated, that's what they want to do from their perspective. To achieve your goal, you must be clear and precise in the directions and limitations to the same extent that permissions to develop is granted within this document. It's absolutely essential that the guidelines be clear. There shall be no, there should be no presumptions that any developer will do the right thing, nor assumptions that everyone knows from their experience what is meant by a particular terminology. The interests that you as our elected councillors represent are not the same interests as any developer, no matter how the developer purports to approach a particular project. The history of this township and its appearances before the OMB and now LPAT point a very clear picture. The language must be clear and precise or it will not be restricted. You cannot use terms like reasonable setback when you want no less than a hundred feet. The Manette committee has spent hours looking at the issues that need to be addressed before an area like Ms. Manette should be allowed to be developed. That the committee, the recommendations that the committee put forth were not influenced by the desires of any particular developer. It was common ground that the building that was permitted under the existing plan was not in the best interest of Manette in the surrounding area or Muskoka in general. It was acquired by the former owner and proposed by that developer for one purpose only, to maximize the profits that could be obtained from this development. The report of the Manette Steering Committee covers the issues which need to be addressed in the OPA. They are clear and precise while being restrictive to preserve the environment. They recommend development limits and clear definitions that should create the foundation of the changes to be made in the township OP and that of the district. At no time was it the purpose or intent of the committee, nor the working group that followed upon the committee's final report last January to preserve the rights of the owner. The current owner of Cleveland's house and the marina and the vast majority of lands in Manette acquired this property, knowing full well that the existing development rights were being reviewed with a view to amending the provisions in the best interest of the community. It was initially reported that he acquired the property to stop it being so intensely built out. He should not now be heard to say that the, that the development rights should be retained because he's the new owner. There is no justification for development to the extent previously proposed, nor what is being proposed now. The proposed residential component is not justified by any of the existing studies and it is contrary to the provincial policy statement. Residential development on land zoned for resorts is contrary to the philosophy that allows for more intense development on such lands. This is especially so when there is plenty of land available in the area west of Judhaven Road 
on which residential development can take place. We ask that you define the requisite terms, bear in mind the environment and be restrictive. Allow resorts and servicing amenities in resort zoned areas and keep residential where it belongs in residentially zoned areas. You each have in the package distributed with this agenda for this meeting, the two studies carried out at the request of the committee. You also have the full report of the committee, which again, I stress, was developed in the best interest of the community. Each of you has also previously in mid-June when the committee submitted its final final report, a synopsis of each of the two consultant studies an abbreviated version of the steering committee's report. I have sent to the chair of the planning committee copies of those three documents with a request that she forward them to each of you. So that might've been what you received a little earlier this morning. The amount of material you will have to consider when forming your opinion on this OP amendment is overwhelming. We hope you haven't had, we hope, we hope if you haven't had the time or the patience to read the full consultants reports and the committee's full reports that you read the three summaries. They will help you appreciate the issues and guide you in your planning. I previously sent and believe it was distributed a brief statement outlining the key issues of using clear and precise terms of determining the appropriateness of residential units on resort zone lands and acceptable extent of same and how those lands are to be serviced. Jim, I'm gonna get you to just if you can sort of wrap up. We're typically on our five minute, even though we're on Zoom and stuff like that. So, and we did all receive a copy of your letter. So hopefully if you can uh, summarize the next little bit. Three lines. While considering these issues, we urge you to bear in mind the natural environment and not allow it to be decimated for another project or two. And finally, protect the water safety by preventing overcrowding. Every member of the steering committee provided the advice they thought best for Minot for Minette. We were not under pressure to compromise to avoid an LPAT hearing, nor were we driven by a profit motive. We provided you with the best we could develop. The ball is now in your court, and we trust you will be guided by what we have provided. We thank you for your time. Thank you for that, Jim. I see Councillor Zavitz has a question. And I'll try and get questions specifically right now of uh, anybody who's uh, speaking, hopefully. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair, through you. Um, and again, I almost want to redirect my question back to Paula, but certainly to, uh, to Jim. I mean, if there was a prevailing attitude of consensus, as the Travis report is, is, is indicating, whatever those words are, Jim said earlier, you better stop using words like reasonable. We better get pretty definitive about what we're now asking. Why, why did we receive a memo on Saturday after all these months and, and in fact, years of negotiation uh, and, and certainly the, the committee, the committees, in fact, the one that was charged by the council to go out there and see what we could do in terms of an arrangement, um, where he stresses a consensus was not reached because in fact, the developer stated their bottom lines. I mean, a negotiation starts with a, a premise that let's go win-win. We both have some things we want to accomplish how, how did we get to a place where, you know, um, Paula will negotiate with, and I, uh, please Paula, with all due respect, that, that your firm will negotiate with us as long as it's a minimum of 1,999 units, which is so much better than 3,800 units and no casino. I mean, I'm being facetious, but to my point, how did we get here where, this almost feels like we're not done yet. Like you people aren't done with your work so that we can, I mean, I was, it'd be very easy for me if you'd come and had complete consensus. Here's the agreement. Wow, easy peasy. But that's not what this is. In fact, I'm hearing and feeling uh, quite a sense of dis, uh, disjoint. There's a disjointed piece happening here. And uh, you're both speaking and telling us your positions. We're to ferret out what's really going on. And Jim, you've done a really good job of stressing to me that you have concerns and I now I'm concerned. So for that. Okay, I'll leave that, um, Jim, unless you want to comment. I, I appreciate that. I, I think, uh, Councillor Zavitz, what I did state um, at the beginning is that uh, I, what was presented on Friday um, has people on both sides somewhat 
frustrated and I respect that. Uh, I think that's probably a good job from the consultant's perspective. Um, and it's nice, uh, Jim made a comment, I think that is appropriate that you guys put on a blank piece of paper what you think is appropriate for Cleveland South with no uh, preconceived notions, no history, no anything. And that is a something for our consideration as council um, that we are the ones though that have to evaluate existing property rights and where we need to go and everything. So that becomes our job going forward. Uh, Jim is one perspective on a blank sheet of paper, what's uh, needed in and around uh, Cleveland South. So, so um, it becomes our job to find the uh, appropriate action going forward. Um, Councillor, do you wanna comment, Jim? Mr. Mayor, if I can just say this, recognize that as chair of the committee, I'm representing the, the position struck by the committee. I participated in the working group and I realized that the distance that Ms. Bustard and, and her company went to try to achieve consensus, but I can't amend the committee's position uh, on, on my feelings about it. I have to tell you what the uh, maintain where the committee was. We did not have ongoing committee meetings to discuss the, the proposals put forward by Paula Bustard. Right. So, Councillor Jagowitz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to thank Jim and through him, his entire committee for the excellent job that I believe they have done. As you are aware, I sat in on a number of those meetings and those people worked hard and they tried to provide a good solution. And of all the material in front of us today and as we go forward, the reports of that committee, you should read them in their entirety and keep them at hand and give them strong weight because it's not one person's opinion or one company's, it's a result of a very diverse group of people. And Jim did an excellent job in trying to encourage a lot of input from developers also. So once again, Jim, great job to you and your committee. Councilor Nishikawa. Thank you. Mostly when I put my hand up, it was to, to you had made some of the comments. I do feel that this is a, a now at the council table and that it's councillors that need to start to be making decisions. Uh, I will say that being on council when we first did the um, the Manette applications for the, the Marriott and, and others, we have much more information today than we did back then. Um, and I believe that our council, should, I, I don't believe that we should be still reaching out to the committees for, for more information. Um, I think we all know what's going on in, in the township of Muskoka Lakes. And I would hope that our council can start stepping up and, and not relying on others to, uh, to do all the heavy lifting. Um, but that, that we can move this forward, not today, but certainly in more um, wholesome, fulsome discussions that we can all be part of. Thank you for that. Uh, Jim, again, thank you uh, for your comments and perspective and also the uh, work of the committee. Um, it uh, is yet another significant report uh, for us to, uh, and council to make a decision going forward. Uh, with the Cleveland South property. So thank you for your uh, tireless efforts uh, that are here today. Um, I'm gonna move on to uh, Deborah Martin Downs from the MLA and Jim will get you to uh, turn off your video. There we go, thank you. Look at that, grandson didn't even help. Deborah, well, welcome to the meeting. Good morning, uh, everyone. And uh, thank you for having us here. Uh, today I'm speaking to you as the uh, president now of the Muskoka Lakes Association and uh, as many of you know I've spoken to you before as a member of the Manette Joint Policy uh, Review Committee and uh, I was very proud to be able to represent the views of the MLA as well as bring my environmental background 
to the table of exceptional people who were uh, gave freely of their time and generously uh, to craft a renewed vision for Manette. So, so we're really proud to be at this point. In my short time today, I want to focus on just three things. Uh, you did receive a letter, a joint letter from the MLA and the Friends of Muskoka late last night, as, <laughs> as your, I hope you turned off the ringers on your emails. Um, and uh, we too are digesting the comments, uh, the, the content of the of the material, and we do reserve the right to make some additional comments in the, as we go along. But first, we want to tell you that we are uh, supportive of the direction that Council is moving in. Uh, generally, the OPA respects and reflects the work that the Minette Joint Policy Review Steering Committee did, and we urge Council now to move rapidly to complete the public consultation requirements and, uh, and to finalize the OPA with, with due haste. It's time to, to make this, uh, to finalize this so we can see the results of the work we've all undertaken. Secondly, while the uh, draft OPA has many good elements in it, there's a few things that we think uh, could be improved. Um, one is that the density is still um, a little bit more than we had anticipated. So while it's generally in line with what the, um, the Manette Joint Policy Review uh, Committee did uh, recommended for gross floor area, uh, there's proportionally more in the waterfront than had been recommended. And we think that there should be a rec uh, reduction in the waterfront um, and as well that the share of the gross, gross floor area in each of the zones should be delineated to prevent uh, from all the material, all the uh, uh, era development from being uh, built in one zone. I would encourage you, the second item I wanna talk about is build back better. And uh, this, uh, there have been very many years of alter alteration in the waterfront uh, and in this area and recent issues related to flooding and climate change. The district's floodplain maps have identified some flood vulnerable structures in Manette. And while there may be what some would consider grandfathered rights, council should seek to ensure that development builds back better to reduce risks and to improve the conditions for the future. These developments are going to result in a complete rebuild. It's not a renovation. And so as such, they should be required to build to today's standards and reflect the floodplains and the setbacks. Uh, as well as some, another area that uh, the uh, policy could be improved on is implementation. So much progress has been made in addressing the mechanisms to ensure what was planned is designed and implemented and maintained for the future. However, one of the key tools we felt that was necessary was uh, to achieve environmental sustainability on a project of this scale was requiring an integrated assessment of the various component studies that are listed in, in the TMLOP required to provide a complete application. Just providing a complete application doesn't ensure that the, the work is integrated. So the draft OPA continues to rely on Schedule F for the, of the TML official plan. Uh, and the Manette uh, Joint Policy Recommendation OPA 20, item 23 is missing and should now be back in, included back in the OPA. The committee found that section F8, 13, 15, 20, 21, and 22 all needed to be presented in a comprehensive development plan. And some in, in my area uh, of work call it a master environmental servicing plan. So such plans are required not just to characterize the area, but also to define impacts of one action on another. So as an example, a wetland requires drainage, surface drainage, and sometimes groundwater uh, contributions. And if the stormwater plan and the hydrogeological studies do not recognize that and work with the ecologists to assess those effects and to provide mitigation, then what was the point of protecting the wetland in the first place? So by creating an integrated plan, it becomes a roadmap for the development and the protection of all aspects of the environment. And it can include that in community and economy in those, in those assessments as well. And the final thing I just want to mention is that it's time for council to articulate your vision for the kind of development that you think is appropriate for the Muskoka waterfront. About the time we started the Minette committee, someone shared an article with me about reimagining tourism by a journalist, Liz Beattie, and she wrote about another rural area that was experiencing growth pressures, the town of Caledon, which happens to be in my day job is in my area. And it's a town of villages. She writes about the same issues that Muskoka is facing, the conflict between locals fighting to protect their way of life and the mounting pressures of growth and the practical realities of economic sustainability that local governments feel. And she then writes about other tourist destinations in the world, like France and Costa Rica, and how they've embraced their uniqueness, the reason people came to their country or area to visit. 
but she also writes about change not being only inevitable, but it's necessary. Every vibrant living thing must change and our communities are doing that too. The question is, is how are we going to take the reins in guiding that change? And this OPA becomes that mechanism. She also writes that we need to embrace new faces, new ideas, and new ways of being, but we also need to protect and together keep connected to the things we love most about the region. And for many of us, they are the very things that we first ventured here to experience as tourists ourselves. And that is where the grassroots vision for uh, community comes in. And that's where you come in. So it's council's turn to speak about what your vision is. You've heard from the MLA and the Friends of Muskoka, as well as the landowners. And now we need your leadership to reflect what is right for Manette and right for all of Muskoka. Thank you for taking the time to hear us today. Thank you. Council, any questions for Deborah at this point? Councilor Nishikawa. Thank you. Deborah, I'm not sure um, if, well, I, I am sure that you can answer this question, but I'm not sure if, I'm, if, if, if it's the right time or place. <laughs> I have been concerned about reading so many of these reports and, and actually in general, uh, decisions that we will be making as a council um, that we don't talk about our the growth in Muskoka because in fact from what I understand our population is going down um, and I don't see a discussion about that in so many ways and I wondered if that was ever contemplated in some of these discussions of, of our actually true growth you know, if we are sitting at 50, 60,000 people, whatever that number is, we have been sitting there for quite some time. And I'm, I'm not quite sure, um, without more discussion about the growth of, of our municipality, uh, how we can look at 10, 20 years going forward. Um, because looking back, we really haven't, we've been going backwards. Deborah, I'm not sure if you want to comment on that. Or not. Well, I'm not sure that I'm the best person to comment on that, but I think the the discussion we were having is not as much about um, what I would call uh, uh, long term or, or um, full time resident growth, but the growth in in tourism and the growth in in um, resort residential or resort uh, the facilitating people coming to the region who who are coming as a as tourists as, or, or as potential landowners, seasonal landowners, not unlike I'm a cottager, I'm a seasonal landowner. But uh, um, so I think that's really where the growth we're talking about really stems from. And is that how do you manage that growth and how do you manage the, the, um, the use of those areas uh, so that you are not impacting on the, on the community that's there because you don't want to lose them because you created a, a monster on one side uh, so that the, the community itself either can't live sustainably or can't live uh, with, with that kind of, of uh, growth that is, is too, so I'm going to say sporadic, but it's more seasonal in that respect. Okay, thank you. Anybody else for Deborah? Thank you, and thank you for keeping us uh, close to five minutes. I appreciate that. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I oh. it was too late last night. I didn't spend a lot of time timing. <laughs> Not a problem. Thank you for having us. Okay, Ian, I'll turn it over to you as part of our committee as well. Uh, good morning, and thanks for the opportunity to speak with you all, Mr. Mayor and, and members of council. Um, uh, before I begin, I can just throw a quick answer to Councillor Nishikawa. The, the growth in Muskoka was one of the things that the steering committee did cover, uh, and we referred to the Hempson growth study, I think, of 2017, which, uh, uh, which uh, said that growth is actually fairly slow, and that was part of the reason why uh, uh, the concluded in the steering committee that there's not a need for a lot of incremental residential development. But anyway, so I'll leave that there. And, but there is a, there is information there you can go to uh, if, if you're curious about that. Um, so I'm here today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, uh, my, the president of the association that I belong to, uh, the Royal Muskoka Island Association, had asked me to delegate today on behalf of 90 or so different partners of the Royal Muskoka Island Association, of which I'm a current director and a past president as well. 
Uh, Ron Muskoka Island is keenly interested and in, in affected by development uh, issues in Minette because we are located minutes away by boat on Lake Rosso and we all have access, we all access our properties via Minette on Jay Road. Um, while I would have liked to speak on behalf of the association today, I'm going to just speak on my own uh, behalf because some of the opinions I have today are relatively fresh and I haven't had the opportunity to run them by uh, the Royal Muskoka Island Association membership or board for the blessings to speak from my, uh, my own opinions based on my involvement with the steering committee and uh, my involvement more recently with the working group and, uh, and my desire to help us get over the uh, finish line with, with this project. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to say also that uh, it's, been a real, uh, uh, it's been challenging and it's been rewarding and it's been a real pleasure and a, and a privilege to work with the steering committee members and the working group members uh, it's, it's been a lot of work, but it's been working with great people who all uh, truly want what's best for, for Minette and for Muskoka. So it's been a privilege and I want to thank council for that opportunity. Uh, so thank you. Um, so we, we have a challenge here. And um, on the one hand, the steering committee was formed two years ago to help fix what we can all agree was a pretty bad set of uh, policies for Minette. On the other hand, we're now blessed with a proponent who really gets Muskoka, uh, whose proposal is a major improvement over those of the previous two proponents, and who has demonstrated a, a real willingness to help improve the policy framework. Um, but at the conclusion of the working group's efforts, uh, so the, the left hand and the right hand still hadn't quite come together on some key issues, and uh, and hopefully we can we can get the rest of the way there. Part of the challenge has been um, that. On the one hand, we're talking, you know, policy apples, and on the other hand, we're talking uh, proposal oranges. And you, 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 the two uh, are separate issues. They're, you know, one's flying at 30,000 feet and one's flying at 10,000 feet. They're never going to come together um, in, in one conversation. And part of the challenge for, the, for me in this process is that while I'm really quite largely comfortable with the proponent's plans as I understand them, uh, the proponent seeks the policies in the OPA which would permit uh, much more development than you would seem to require for his stated plans. So I have no, I have no reason to doubt that uh, the Mitch Goldhart will do what he says to the best of his abilities in a manner that would be wonderful for Muskoka. Uh, that said, these policies that go into the OPA will be enshrined and, and could well outlive the proponent's tenure in Minette. A subsequent proponent may not share his vision for Minette, nor his appreciation for everything that makes Muskoka so precious for us all. And should this happen, we might come to regret policy choices that we later deem in hindsight to have been over permissive. So personally, I've, I've felt really torn between wanting to support a project that could be fantastic for Minette and wanting to avoid policies that could ultimately be harmful for Minette. So it's been a challenging process for me and I'm sure for all of us. Um, this draft OPA that was presented, uh, uh, released on Friday and presented today has been a long time coming. It's the product of a huge amount of collective effort by many people. And I would like to uh, recognize and thank David Pink and his team for their tireless efforts in helping to shepherd us all to this point. Thank you. It's a, it, it's a Herculean task and, uh, and you, <laughs> better you than me. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm thrilled to see that many of the steering committee's final recommendations have been uh, reflected in this OPA. I won't go into all the, uh, the, the OPA's many successes. I'll just say well done and thank you for all of those. And I would like to focus on a, a few opportunities for some uh, further improvement. Uh, I've submitted a separate document uh, in which I, uh, I uh, annotated a copy of the OPA uh, with some comments inserted. Uh, so you can go into those if you'd like to get into the nitty gritty of it. For now, I'll just keep my thoughts relatively high level. Uh, the concerns that I have that I'd like to address today are, are uh, density, uh, residential use in the waterfront, servicing, uh, the quantity of dock slips, and the designation of a resort village. Um, so first of all, on density. Ian, I'm going to get I you. I think a, we're getting there. Consensus. I'll just get you to try and uh, be very brief on each topic, as uh, I think uh, okay. we'll your submission, and but trying to keep uh, everybody moving along today. So we're already at about the four minute mark. All right. Oh wow. Okay. Right. Well, I'll, I'll jump straight to my suggestions. And on density, 
I won't get into detail, but I would suggest that if we could agree on 1,750 unit equivalents total for Minette in Schedule C and D, uh, and that maybe 750 of those uh, would be the limit in Schedule C, which is the waterfront lands, I would say that by taking this approach, uh, we would accomplish a fair bit of what the steering committee had set out to do with their density recommendations. As far as residential goes, uh, if we have to have any uh, residential in the uh, uh, in the waterfront commercial zone, then uh, I would say uh, I'm happy with the provisos outlined in this draft OPA, but I would also say that uh, uh, any kind of uh, legal uh, framework that, uh, that made this possible would have to be done in a way that minimizes the risk of it serving as a precedent and being replicated elsewhere in Muskoka, and that it should only happen once the bona fide uh, commercial aspects of the resort are established. Um, as far as private communal servicing goes, I think we're all on the same page. We like it. It's just how is this going to work, uh, especially where, uh, where residential is concerned and individual ownership. So if that can be figured out, then I'm willing to go there. I think it's a smarter choice for Manette. But we need to figure out, especially if, uh, if, if the resort goes bust, who's left uh, further up the pipe with nowhere to flush. Um, and uh, so that there has to be a legal framework around that. Dockage, I think I'll skip that because I believe Mr. Pato will address that in more depth. Uh, and uh, the resort village, this may seem like nothing, but uh, it, I think it's important to call it what it is. It's not a resort village. Resort villages are you know, Deerhurst, Taboo, Gravenhurst, places where municipal servicing is already in place. And there's ample supply of access to roads, and it's you know those are towns and in, uh, in in spirit and, and in practical sense, there's education, there's health services. Minette is none of those, nor do we want it to be. Everyone there calls it a hamlet. Let's call this a resort hamlet. Create a new special designation for it. It's more appropriate, and I think it would make everyone happier. And that brings me to the end of my comments. I'd like to everyone can see for the enormous progress so far, and I think we are on the 90-yard line. I uh, hope we can all continue to work together to get us over the uh, into the end zone. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Ian. And again, thank you for your work uh, on both committees uh, as we've gone forward to get to today. Any questions of Mr. Newell at this point? Okay, we're good. Again, uh, appreciate the comments. And I know uh, I'm sure that Paul is also uh, taking equal notes as to where we go forward. Um, I'll go to uh, Ken Pierce. We'll, we'll try and go for maybe another 10 or 15 more minutes and then maybe take a brief break, but uh, maybe we'll get through the uh, remaining three. Uh, Ken? Way to turn on your uh, camera as well would be great. I'm not sure. Not sure how I do that. Can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you. Do we know how to maybe Kelly, we can turn his on? I'm not sure. I think you might have to do that yourself. There's probably another button on your computer. I don't know what kind of computer you're on or... Oh, there you go. Now we got you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mayor and Councillors, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, uh, I'm a director of the Friends of Muskoka. Uh, three areas I'd like to touch on. Uh, residential on the waterfront, uh, conditions for commerciality and environmental protections. Uh, I certainly appreciate the efforts of uh, the MJR, uh, the, the Met Joint Steering Committee and the Working Group and the planning staff at both the uh, township and district level. I think there's a number of positives that have come out of this. Uh, certainly appreciate the, the limit of maximum of 26 weeks per year and maximum four weeks in July and August for uh, uh, unit owners for exclusive use. Uh, the residential on the waterfront, as we've heard, uh, the current district and township official plan uh, provides for no residential uh, unless on municipal services. Uh, I would draw council's attention to the uh, planning consultant's opinion uh, that was included with the materials that's uh, by Travis. And at the end, they talk about servicing. It's very clear that municipal services are strongly preferred. Uh, municipal services are uh, said to be more environmentally sustainable and operationally accountable. Uh, I'm sure the district is concerned about its liability if things uh, don't go well with private communal services. Uh, I think people refer to them as PCS. Uh, the Travis uh, uh, opinion notes that uh, any use of com communal services for residential uses uh, is a difficult land use 
uh, planning recommendation. And, and I would read that to mean that uh, it's generally not recommended. And so if you were to do this, uh, it's uh, as Travis also says, it is imperative that such systems are under strict monitoring and responsibility agreements. I think Paula had mentioned that as well. There will be challenges to putting something in place to do this. Uh, the size of the development is also a factor and, and this is at the high end of the range for, for developments. Uh, if you wanted to go this route, uh, I think you've got a number of things you have to be uh, uh, thinking about. A uh, serious amount of security would need to be posted by the resort owner to deal with system failure, required maintenance and upgrades, monitoring and oversight agreements would have to be put in place. Uh, you'd have to build to an appropriate standard. I think that is built in uh, now, so that's good. Uh, what happens if the resort shuts down, goes bankrupt, goes into receivership, or the resort owner has sold off most or all of the lands that uh, other than the uh, uh, PCS facilities? Uh, and you know, does it really have a sufficient economic interest to address any concerns going forward? Maybe it, maybe it's just not worth its while. And so, uh, as was said. Uh, you know, the residential use, uh, you flush your toilet, and nothing happens. Uh, that's a problem. So I think that sort of leads you to believe that limited residential uh, would be permitted, if at all. Uh, and, you know, other questions, there is no public utility here. Who regulates the prices? What if the prices for, for use of the access to them goes through the roof? And then the corollary issue is, if the unit owner is being charged too much or if the system fails or there's nobody there to look after it, will residential users be allowed to have their own septic? Uh, will they uh, be able to draw water from the lake? Uh, do you need to worry about setbacks and easements and access to the water? Uh, size of acreage for residential units? You know, do they need to be a third of an acre to allow for something like that? Uh, what will residential users be told about risks and costs? Uh, of being on private communal services, uh, you know, who's going to tell them? I mean, they, I think they would need to be informed if you go this route. Uh, will uh, the resort owner build it oversized to deal with uh, 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 additions to residential on the other side of Judd Haven, for example, if another thousand units and, and in the years to come, if more are built, or, or will it build just enough for now, which understandable, but, you know, can it be, you uh, uh, designed in such a way that increases are permitted. Uh, who's going to bear the cost of that and how does that all work? Um, we certainly don't want to see temporary systems and we certainly don't want to see undersized systems. Uh, the other thing is phase development. I, I think that we've had experience where residential, you know, there's sort of mixed use and there's residential and commercial and the residential gets built first and the commercial doesn't get built or not all of it gets built. And so I think, uh, uh, section 6.1.3E uh, and 6.2.3E talk about phase development and, and talk about you have to have some uh, resort commercial accommodation units built and you have to have some appropriate amount of uh, resort amenities built. I think those really need to come first or at the very least be contemporaneous. I think that before you should get building permits for residential, uh, these things should either be built or, or uh, you don't get occupancy permits or whatever until they are built. Um, the one thing that I noted, it, it reads resort related residential uses as residential, uh, and I've never heard of such a phrase, resort related residential uses. What does that mean? I think it means residential units uh, in the resort commercial uh, waterfront zone. So I, I think we need to be clear, we're talking about residential. Um, the other area is conditions of commerciality for uh, resort commercial accommodation units. I think it's a good start at the end of the document. Uh, I think you also need to look at what was put into the Villa's Touchstone Condo Agreement and the legacy LPAT decision. Uh, there are a number of other provisions that should go in, uh, also from Schedule X of the Manette Steering Committee final report. Uh, some examples, uh, units may only be rented through the mandatory rental pool. Uh, owners and guests must check in and out when using their units. Uh, rates uh, and uh, uh, entitlement to determine who goes, uh, who uses the unit should be uh, for the uh, resort manager and not the unit owners. Um, also, if residential should be permitted in the residential uh, resort commercial zones, uh, those units, if somebody wants to rent them out, that should go through the rental pool as well. We, we wouldn't want to see those going through Airbnb. If it's on the resort property, it should be through the rental pool. 
Um, another area is environmental protections. I think it's a very good start in the uh, 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 draft OPA. Uh, as I said, I'm very concerned about septic on private communal systems. Uh, I think that there's some good wording in there about being aesthetically pleasing, uh, vegetation and height uh, restrictions. Uh, the view from the canoe and, and you know, maximum height of 45 feet, I think those are very, very important. Uh, I would encourage you to read the uh, MLA FOM letter, uh, especially the section environment first, which is section one, as it should be. Uh, one uh, question, uh, maybe for the planning staff and David Pink, uh, the legacy LPAT decision made it very clear that the general waterfront policies, uh, policy B, uh, do not apply to Minette. And that was that was an error, I think, uh, from 2008. And I, I uh, my question is, uh, has this been corrected or is this on the radar screen? And I think I think that should be looked into. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, Council, any questions for Mr. Pierce at this point? Okay, I think we're good and appreciate that. And um, uh, you raised some uh, interesting questions. Council Mazan. Oh, sorry, uh, and thank you through you. Just uh, if I could get uh, Mr. Pierce's comments at some point in writing, that would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think uh, for anybody who's delegating any of your notes, would if you could uh, forward them off to uh, Mr. Pink, would be appreciated, and they can be circulated to all of council. So, anyone else? Yes. Comments? Okay, Ken. Thank you very much, and uh, appreciate it. We'll get you to uh, mute and turn off your camera again as we move on. And uh, we're approaching our ten thirty. We'll see how uh, Mr. Pato, if he can get us in under the wire, Frank. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks for the chance to participate today. I think you've heard a lot of good things from the earlier um, presenters, and so I don't want to repeat, but I would uh, endorse what they say. I, I also want to um, clarify a couple of comments I heard that I don't agree with as a member of the Monette Joint Policy Review Steering Committee. Um, Mr. Mayor, you, you claimed that what we wrote, and I think you mischaracterized what was said by Mr. Lewis and maybe just misheard, was that we started with a fresh piece of paper to say what's best for Minette. I don't think that's true as a member of the committee. We were very cognizant of the development rights that the owner had. We were very cognizant of what was in the existing OP and what we tried to recommend through two years of very hard work, a lot of expert study, a lot of negotiation, a lot of back and forth was consensus recommendations that appropriately balanced those development rights the developer had, what was in the old OP with what's best for Manette. So I don't see the uh, Manette Joint Policy Review Steering Committee's recommendations as a starting point for negotiations uh, as a fresh piece of paper, what we all want to see. I see it as already a compromised position that tries to balance parties. Now, I also concur with uh, Councillor Nishikawa and Deb Martin Downs that this is really your job now. It's not our job. Our job is over as members of the committee. But um, I would take issue with what I heard characterized from Ms. Bustard on behalf of Cleveland's House that this draft OPA is a step backwards. I don't see that at all. I see this draft OPA as my understanding. I was not on the working group, but our committee was represented by Chair Lewis and I'd ask him to speak to this point. But my understanding is that the early work of the working group was overly influenced by the developer. In fact, the developer's count, um, consultant took it upon themselves to provide many comments drafting on their own behalf what they thought the OPA should say. And this is the first draft of an OPA actually prepared by a consultant hired by the township uh, to represent what's best for the township. And to the extent that it better reflects what was the recommendations from our Manette Joint Policy Review Steering Committee, which was a balanced committee, I think this is a step in the right direction, not a step backwards. And frankly, I want to thank and commend the members of council, the members of staff, and you, Mr. Mayor, your worship, um, for uh, making the choices that put forward this draft, because I think there's a lot to like here. I think the overall density is in line with what was recommended by the Minette Joint Policy Review Steering Committee. I think the challenge is that um, what's proposed here has roughly 45% of the density on the 65 acres of the uh, majority owner's lands that are you know, right on the waterfront on the east side of Judd Haven Road, whereas the Minette Joint Policy Review Steering Committee recommended less than 20%. So that's more than twice as much. 
But I think that's addressed by the provision that no more than 50% of that 750,000 square feet can be developed as accommodation space. As to the issue of, and the last thing I would say is, you know, yes, there's an existing OP that provides for a lot more GFA and a lot more units, but that's all predicated upon municipal servicing. And I think everybody agrees that municipal servicing is no longer not only desired, but justified based on the expert studies we've had done. And so the question is how much, if any, uh, residential usage should be permitted on those key 65 acres. And I actually think what you've put forward is a reasonable solution because the way I read it, it's gonna be 25% of 375,000 square feet, which is you know 50% of the total 750,000 square feet suggested for the 65 waterfront acres. And if you do that math, I believe it works out to roughly 110 residential units on those 65 waterfront acres. And going back to Ken Pierce's point, what if the system fails for whatever reason? What recourse do those residential owners have if their sewage isn't being treated? And you know, the township, I guess, could take it over and have a liability for the township. But ultimately, one solution would be that they would build their own septic systems, just like any other residential owner. And I think there's a minimum amount of land you need to have a functioning septic system. And I believe it's something like a third of an acre. And so, you know, 110 units on 65 acres. Now, granted, you can't put the septic fields within 100 feet of the water. So maybe there's only 40 acres that are actually usable if you had to put private septic in as a solution for those residential units. 110 residential units on roughly 40 usable acres is kind of, you know, a little bit less than a third of an acre or a little bit more than a third of an acre, I guess, is less than three units per acre. So that makes sense to me. I think there's a lot to like in this plan. Uh, I think the conditions on commercial usage are good, but I'm really here to talk about one thing, which is docking, because really this is all about, in my mind, how many units can you put on the waterfront, on those 65 key acres, and on the bay, which is roughly 57 hectares. And to put this in perspective, just to remind you, this is a proposal to build almost 2,000 units on fronting 57 hectares of waterfront. The total unit count on Lake Joseph, Lake Rosso, Cottages and resorts combined is roughly 3,000. So this is roughly two thirds of all the cottages and resort units existing today on Lake Rosso and Lake Joseph, which have total lake surface of roughly 12,000 hectares. So this is a bay that is 200 times smaller than the total lake surface of Joseph and Rosso. And these proposals are to put in roughly two thirds the total unit count. Now there's been a lot of good things done to limit the size of a unit. I, I, I support that. And I think that's been terrific to put conditions on commercial usage. I support that. But the thing that concerns me the most, frankly, as someone who lives on an island less than a mile away is the boats and the boat traffic. At the end of the day, anybody that owns a residence is gonna to wanna to have a boat. The second home study tells us that the average cottager's got two boats. And so I think you have to limit the number of residential units that you build on the waterfront in that small bay based on the boat traffic study we had done. Now, Al isn't here to talk to it, but I spent a lot of time on this as a member of the Joint Policy Review Steering Committee as one of three people charged with helping to coordinate that boat traffic study. And the most important finding you came up with is that 12 years ago, the study that was done to justify the creation of this resort village in the first place was deeply flawed. It assumed an average lake surface per motorized boat of just one and a half hectares. Mr. Lewis Riverstone's review of 10 different expert studies involving 25,000 boats showed that the average recommended lake surface per motorized boat is in fact five times larger at seven and a half hectares. Even using the same flawed analysis that was done 12 years ago, the five times smaller margin of safety, Riverstone still found that the boat traffic in Wallace Bay exceeded the, boat, the safe boating capacity of the area more than one out of every four times they measured on four weekends or four, four days last summer. What's changed since 2008 is the boat traffic in total has gone up roughly 50%, more than 50%. Wow. On average, roughly a thousand boats a day in that small area of just 50 hectares. The clear consensus is you cannot dramatically increase the boat docking in this area because you've already got a problem with traffic. In the last 12 years, the number of resort units went up by 200 and the measured number of boats per day on average went up by 260. You're now proposing to add close to 1700 units. You must limit the boat docking. I strongly recommend that this council puts in place a hard cap on the total number of boat docks that will be permitted in this bay in total. What the proponent has asked for is to have 215 boats 
blessed and grandfathered. That doesn't exist today. There's 95 of those 215 slips are under a hold provision for measures to address public safety that were put in place 12 years ago and have yet to be addressed. What we recommend as the Minette Committee is there could be a 20% increase. He's got roughly 120 uh, slips today. So that 20% increase will be 25, not 95. Okay. I think there's a potential for a solution. Again. My, my point is this, Phil. I, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. My point is this. I think there's a basis for an amicable solution to this. I encourage the parties, uh, you as on behalf of the township, to keep working with a proponent to come up with a solution. I would meanwhile put this draft forward for public comment so the public can opine. It's been two years now the public should opine. Uh, but I do think that the boat traffic is just indicative of one area where I think a solution has to come. And most importantly, you have to come up with an ultimate hard cap of how many boat slips are going to be allowed in this area, given what we've learned from the expert studies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council, any questions of Mr. Pato? Again, we received uh, an email I know earlier this morning from uh, Mr. Pato that uh, some may have digested, some not. Councillor Bridgman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Harding. As someone who is in the extension of Wallace Bay, and I actually look at Mr. Pato's island, which is uh, lovely, I just wanted to ask you, uh, Frank, because my thoughts, uh, having watched uh, two wakeboarding uh, school boats all day long, all summer in this bay, going back and forth, would it be possible to basically say, we need to put the speed limit from Tommy Rock or where your island is right into the end of Wallace Bay down to a no wake zone so that we could accommodate more boats coming in and out safely and alleviate um, what is going to one day be a tragic accident uh, on the on the uh, trajectory we're on now. Would that be something, and I'm just throwing that out as a thought, but is would that be something that might work in your mind? I just want your input. Yeah, that is the condition under the whole provision to a, a, at least those 95 boat slips that was put in place 12 years ago. Uh, I'm not an expert on municipal planning or transport law, but my understanding is that's not controlled by the township, that's controlled by Transport Canada, federal jurisdiction. I think just as a matter of logic though, if you lower the speed limit in one area, all you're gonna do is move all those boats out to the very edge of that area. And you're gonna dramatically increase the number of boats because we just suggested, but you're just gonna have those boats as soon as they get beyond the restriction, will all go back to doing their same activities. They're just gonna move it a few hundred yards away. So I don't think that's the ultimate solution. I think the ultimate solution is to come up with what you think is appropriate for this bay. And you know, I'm not a zealot. I'm not a I'm not, not an absolutist. The committee recommended an increase of 25 docks. Essentially, um, the proponents asked for 95. I think there's a solution between those two numbers that works. But I think the broader issue is to think through how many dock slips are you going to allow over time, because it, I think this will get built out over time. I think having a development plan that requires balance of growth is important. So it doesn't all happen in one area that you don't envision it all happening in one area. But you know, if you're gonna build you know, hundreds of residential units, they're gonna wanna have boat parking for hundreds of boats. And I think you should be putting in place now and making it clear to the principal landowner and to others that there's gonna be a limit on the number of docks that are permitted in this bay based on the issues we have with boat traffic. Anybody else, any comments? Okay, thank you uh, for that, Frank. Uh, and I think we're gonna go uh, to Mr. Richards, one last uh, delegate, and then we'll take a break if that's okay with uh, council. Uh, Frank, we'll get you to turn your camera off and thank you. And then Paul Richards, get your camera on and your microphone. I'm not sure if Paul's there or not. We might have lost Paul. He's still there. Oh, Hello. There. Yeah, no, you had it for a second there, Paul. You had your microphone on. There you go. And we just Good. turned the video on. All right. How do I do that? Probably the other button that says video. Okay. Oh, yes. Good. There we go. Got it. Welcome. Well done. Good. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, Councillor, staff, and fellow Zoomers, thank you for this opportunity to be with you. 
Uh, because of previous remarks, I've had to change some of my remarks and some of it may be a little rough, but I'll try. I just feel that everybody's got to be aware that there's a real danger that we can't accept what is allowed now in Manette as appropriate or normal. The fouler financial might and a receptive council won against the unanimous hostility of the Manette community. And this all happened many years ago. I was part of this hostility. We lost everything. And with one peak at the legacy travesty, you can see the results of this bad planning. There isn't another property north of Toronto enjoying these unique development rights without municipal service. This isn't something that my job uh, is to tell you a little bit about the view from the new. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a paddler. And uh, most important, you need to be safe to view anything from your canoe. There are already, already too many boats operating in Manette Bay and the threat of more docks and more power boats is intimidating. My experiences, uh, I, I've had very close to a tragic accident. I have been yelled at for being in the way from ski boats crossing in our evening paddle trying to cross the bay. From the canoe, you would want to see a gradient in height from the water to a four foot hotel or condo at the back of the property. You would want the aesthetics, the trees, the natural greenery, the colors and designs, and another issue often forgotten, the acoustics. Even the beloved Cleveland's house had a problem. Too many neighbors around the bay with the entertainment noise at night, crossing the water and keeping young children awake. Hotels can be very noisy. And the density, too many units. We will end up with another legacy. And as per our district chair, the district chair encouraged all councillors to visit Manette and have a look at the unnamed property that they all know is a scar on the landscape. He said that a picture paints a thousand words and I do not want to be part of the administration that puts policies together that allows that kind of travesty to happen again because it is entirely inappropriate what has happened on that piece of property. And my next concern, the septic. As most of you are aware, we've had a very troubling experience with the raw sewage spills into the lake from the Marriott. Let me tell you our story. About 10 years ago, we started to experience weeds growing in our swimming water near the shore. Worse each year. But the good news, after the Fowler Legacy property was closed for septic problems, the weeds diminished year by year. And this year, after the closing of Cleveland's house, we can report with joy, no more weeds. It wasn't global warming. It was someone else's septic. I now, I now realize that most of what we are talking about is the environment. Please put it first and good design will follow. Thank you all. Thank you, Paul. Uh, any questions for Mr. Richards at this point? Okay, thank you. Um, Council, I think uh, what we're gonna do is uh, take about a, a 10 minute break. We'll come back at, uh, let's say 10 to 11, nine minute break, if that's okay. We'll refresh your coffees. And then I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Pink to uh, take us through some high level uh, OPA suggestions and where we may wanna go from here. So we'll see you all in about eight or nine minutes. Thank you.
Okay, are we back recording? We're still live again. Sorry about that, Council. A little technical difficulty as to where we're heading. Um, and uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's in Chicago, there seven, I believe, eight, nine, and 10. Um, thank you. Uh, let me just go, I think, uh, probably just to introduce the high level um, where we're at today. And then, uh, David, you can give us some options as to maybe where we want to go and how we may want to proceed in the coming months. There is, uh, I think there was a, a resolution suggested that uh, we can start to solicit some public comment, which might be a good idea. And then we can debate some more, but I'll leave it to David at this point. David. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, good morning, Council. Um, I'd just uh, I'd like to start my comments again, uh, similar to after the steering committee uh, mandate concluded, uh, just to thank all those working group uh, members again uh, for all their hard work and volunteer time. I think a lot of great progress was made. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Paula Bustard and her team as well uh, for a lot of compromise and a lot of uh, good, fruitful discussions. I think the uh, this portion of the process was uh, quite successful moving the um, the yard stick uh, further down the line. Um, I won't uh, go into uh, great detail in the report of the various drafts, certainly here to answer any questions from Council, um, but you do have it uh, uh, before you. I think the only thing I, I would state is that it can be quite difficult in the type of discussions that the working group had, and I think they were very fruitful and moving uh, in progress, but it's very hard uh, for a third party consultant to step in or even staff to definitively state uh, with every policy and every specific wording and language whether consensus was in fact reached or not. So hopefully all the groups understand um, that a lot of generalities and high level uh, positions were taken uh, in, in trying to come together with a draft OPA that tries to capture where consensus was reached. But again, um, certainly very difficult to, to definitively state that in every instance. Uh, when it comes to moving forward, um, I think the main thing I would stress to Council uh, what you have before you, uh, you're not uh, looking today or the recommendation certainly not for Council to adopt uh, or in other words approve uh, this draft official plan amendment. Certainly staff is cognizant that you've received a lot of uh, information um, relatively late as of Friday uh, for today's meeting and I don't think it's reasonable to expect any type of uh, glowing endorsement or, or adoption of the draft in front of you. Keep in mind the staff report, the recommendation uh, that's before Council is simply to circulate that draft for public and stakeholder comments and that a concurrent open house and statutory public meeting with the District of Muskoka be scheduled. So that is the, uh, the recommendation before Council. If Council is not, uh, certainly I'm uh, and staff are at the will of Council. If Council is comfortable in, in reading that resolution and discussing it today, uh, that's fine. If more time is needed to even consider that resolution, certainly I would look to Council and the Mayor uh, to discuss whether that uh, can be done at the regular special, or sorry, the regular uh, September Council meeting, or whether a special uh, Council meeting needs to be scheduled in order to move that along. Uh, my main recommendation would be, if it is not considered today, uh, that it is considered before the District of Muskoka Planning Committee meets uh, at their regularly scheduled September meeting. I think we need to show them uh, direction. Otherwise, I would uh, suspect that they may not move forward at their meeting, which would uh, cause another month delay. Um, so I'll leave my comments, initial comments at that. Certainly here to answer any questions uh, on the report and the draft OPA, the process to date, and steps moving forward. Uh, thank you for that, David. Uh, Great, appreciated. Uh, Councillor Bridgman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Harding, and to um, to Director Pink, I just want to thank him because I, I understand how much he's had on his plate and, and bringing this forward by the end of August was a, uh, a big challenge. So uh, thank you. But David, I've got a, a question then and maybe a comment. Um, what would be the timing of the public meeting? Like, let's say we decided to send this out the door today or before it needs to go, in my humble opinion, before the district looks at it near the end of September in order to keep this process moving along. But what would be the date? I, I, I think we would be curious to know, what do you think would be the public, um, joint public meeting date? David? Yes, 
Uh, thank you for, uh, for that, through your worship. Um, and, and this is something, again, I've touched on in the report that I think council needs to be comfortable with. Uh, as you probably are all familiar, typically significant development proposals such as this under normal circumstances, uh, there would be a public meeting likely in the summer months. Uh, and of course, in person. Um, council needs to be comfortable uh, that this will be likely in the off season and over digital means. Uh, but to directly answer the question, if everything goes, uh, we'll call smoothly, and this resolution is uh, passed in largely its form, uh, and a similar uh, resolution is passed by the district at their September meeting, what would happen after that date? Uh, staff and the consultants would prepare a notice um, to go out to the public. Uh, keep in mind there's certain statutory length requirements that the public needs to be circulated that before a public meeting date, typically 20 days. Um, so when you do that math, you're likely looking at a meeting um, probably uh, early to mid-November. Okay. Hey, can, can I uh, follow up? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay, so based on, on that, I guess speaking as chair of planning, I think there's two scenarios available to us today. The first would be because this is just a draft basically to get public input, which we need before we can even form our quote vision. I believe we need to hear from the public. If council was comfortable with that, we could actually adopt the recommendation to, to get that part started and still have um, a special planning meeting to spend a day really digging in so that everybody understands what's in here. And and uh, and if not, then just a special planning meeting. And at the end of that day, when everybody understands, we could uh, endorse this recommendation just to get this out the door. I think you just wanna make sure that we're not endorsing what's in here. We just wanna hear what the public has to say. So um, I leave that up to you. Uh, I'm good with either one. I, I think the deadline for us is before the district meeting September, I think you said 24th, Mr. Pig. So that's my Thank you. comment. Thank you. Yeah, Councilor Nishikawa has got a question or comment. Thank you. I, I have uh, great concerns about the information that we received, I'll say this morning, primarily, um, that we are actually moving this stuff on to district at this point when we um i don't think we're ready and i don't think we're going to be ready by september 24th to um make recommendations to district and my concern is is that a lot of information will be thrown at them and then in fact their reports might not look what we want to be presented um very very concerned about this whole timing issue I'm, I have been a, aware that historically issues like this have taken us years, not, um, I, I really hope that we're not rushing something. One of my questions was going to be to, to David, uh, we didn't receive an application at this point. So we're not looking at um, a situation where if council uh, actually gives some more thoughtful consideration um, that we're going to be slammed with a lawsuit because it's, historically that has been the case as well by lack of action from our council. I don't think we're in that situation, I believe, um, but uh, I, I would look to David Pink for certainly for, for his response on that. I really have a lot of concerns though that in fact in three weeks time, we're supposed to come up with what we want, might want district to, to look at. Um, I don't think we want district to look at the whole gamut of stuff that we've received today without a recommendation from our council. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, just uh, confirming with uh, Director Pink, the idea of the district is that it is a joint meeting and a joint discussion to solicit input from the public on the entire draft OPA. They have to do a public meeting statutory and so do we. So the question is, uh, is what's on the table, what we wanna ask questions from the public. Clearly, obviously it has solicited some comment from the public and then it's for us and the district to make 
recommendation. I think Councillor Shikau, you made another comment that there's um, uh, no application. That's exactly correct. There is no application today. I think the idea is we're trying to get out ahead of an application to make sure the official plan um, has uh, a different set of rules and regulations, if you will. Otherwise, if an application is received, we have to follow it under what's current in the LP. So hence the reason we're moving ahead of time. Um, David, did you want to speak or are you? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Just to, to add to that, to, to make clear, uh, as part of the report uh, today, there was hope to be a, a similar OPA to the district official plan. Now, unfortunately, that wasn't completed in time, um, but that will be ready for the September 24th district planning committee meeting. And they will have a similar discussion as you're having today. They'll have um, a very similar resolution to consider circulating that district official plan amendment and scheduling a public meeting. So today's meeting or the resolution before you again is not to submit comments endorsing that to the district. Uh, they will take a similar path and will consider a district official plan amendment and scheduling a joint meeting with us. And that's why uh, my comments were that uh, to keep the process moving as efficiently as possible, it would be helpful if they knew our position beforehand. Uh, just in response to Councillor Nishikawa's question, uh, just echo uh, the mayor's comments. This was not a, a developer initiated or a property owner initiated application. This was a municipally initiated exercise. This was uh, resulted as of uh, the passage of the interim control bylaw approximately two and a half years ago now. And we're finally at the stage where we have a draft OPA that we can get uh, public comments on. Uh, so there are no timelines in that respect. As the mayor alluded to, part of the concern with the interim control bylaw and the sense of the urgency uh, was to get moving on this process so that we in fact don't receive a rezoning application in the interim. Um, that would, uh, again, part of the reason the interim control bylaw was passed, I believe, by council. Okay, thank you for that. I'll go to Councillor Edwards and Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you. Just a uh, question for uh, David. Uh, I know Summer has sat in on an awful lot of, of the meeting fr from the district. Has, have you had uh, discussions with the uh, district on uh, private servicing? Because if, if they turn it down, this uh, and that this is just basically toilet paper. On private servicing. That. Certainly, uh, the district and I have had uh, many discussions on servicing, but obviously not uh, at a committee or, or council level. Uh, and it will be interesting to see uh, the feedback we get. Uh, I think those who have been involved in the working group to date uh, know the importance and the difficulty of that servicing question. Uh, and it, uh, you're correct, uh, which, which route the district chooses to go on that will dictate largely what, uh, what we can do in our OP. And it will be interesting to see when that uh, lands on there. Uh, on their tables uh, in the coming weeks. And that a uh, supplemental. Also, David, uh, when we had the last meeting, I had asked uh, in that Paula's group uh, about private servicing. Uh, they said they, they would uh, provide some information. Have they sent it to you? Because I think they have done other uh, areas where they've, they've put housing on uh, private services quite successfully. And that's what I was looking for as well. Uh, that would be helpful going forward to the district at this time. And I would like to have it brought up maybe at the, at the district meeting to see if, if, uh, if it's even possible to go with, with uh, private servicing. And then, and then we can bring this forward to the public. But it's just a thought. I'd like your thoughts on it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you. And through you, <clears throat> I, uh, I'm of the opinion that we need to get the public consultation process started at least uh, sooner rather than later with whatever notices we need to get underway. Uh, but I must tell you, I'm really concerned about the uh, restrictions or limitations um, that COVID presents uh, in, in that we will be receiving uh, public uh, feedback through this technology. Uh, even those of us who use it regularly can find it challenging. Um, and I think to the extent that it's possible, we need, first of all, to be a little more lenient in terms of time allocation. Uh, number two, we need to understand, I think that the thing will be completely oversubscribed. This will be a huge uh, volume. There will be a huge volume of, of commentary and we have to figure out the right way to accommodate that without crushing the, the uh, technology. 
and, and number three, I don't know what, what kind of creativity we can exercise, uh, whether we can receive pre-recorded video clips from people who might be more comfortable doing it you know, in their own home and then sending it on, or whether we can have somebody stand in and, and read through people's uh, submissions uh, so that they're read into the record or read on the way they would be if they were in person. Uh, or if in fact, maybe something like a speaker's corner can be set up. And I realize there's all sorts of COVID issues related to that, but invite people to make different uh, efforts uh, because the frustration that people will feel trying to deal with this in a very constricted timeline uh, is gonna lead to more trouble than it'll fix. Okay, uh, understood. Uh, I see Councillor Nishikawa, your hand is up again. Sorry, it was mostly in response to something that uh, a comment that you had made. And I, I guess I just want to uh, clarify for the number of years that I've been involved in district and receiving information uh, three and four days ahead of time and then not being able to um, react from a township of Muskoka Lakes perspective um, really concerns me. And I really would hope that we were going to be stronger with whatever we were going to be sending forward or recommending. I just think that there is so much detail involved. Um, I, I just think we're, I think we're rushing this if we're, we're hoping that we're going to get the type of report that we want out of district to even recommend a public meeting. Uh, I'm very, very concerned about that because in fact, we're gonna see it just days before. And remember, we only have four votes. Councillor Jagowitz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> as I see it, uh, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm supportive of moving this forward and not overly delaying it, but we also have to move it forward in a responsible manner. I see really two, two issues here. One is moving it forward to the district and the other is moving it forward to the public. But as far as the district is concerned, and, and it's my view, but it, it could be incorrect, that the district's big concern will be over the servicing issue. And um, therefore, I don't see any problem with it going to the district as long as we've had an opportunity to provide them some, uh, our position on that issue, or at least a preliminary position on that particular issue. As far as the public is concerned, we're now talking November, so we do have time. Also, we have just heard from a large uh, percentage of the public. Uh, these two groups that came forward, uh, MLA, FOM, I know the MRA weren't in there, but uh, uh, so we've heard a lot from the public and I think we've got enough. Uh, a lot of us haven't even read it all or had a chance to digest it. So I think having a meeting sometime in September, a planning meeting as the chair of planning has suggested is a good idea that we can have a discussion on what we've heard so far and do two things. See if there are issues that we're uncomfortable with uh, before it goes out to the public. Uh, and then secondly, try to uh, wrestle with that servicing issue before it goes to the district. And I think that would be a, a good meeting. It, it won't come out with any, any solutions, but that I think it would, um, and, and I don't, although public can be allowed to, to present it, that I, I, don't, I don't see that as a, you know, that planning meeting really having public comments. We, we've got them, I, be, I believe. And um, like I, for one, I've raised my issue with you, the issue I have with residential development in the resort area. And if that's going to be allowed, it should be on private services. So I, I'd like that uh, thing to be further discussed by all of council. Maybe I'm out to lunch. Uh, so I, I, uh, I support moving it forward, but I also support that we have our input before it goes to the public. In other words, whether it goes forward in this form with council's concerns and, and, and comments, or whether it's a modified version I can work with. I also believe we need to give the district some direction on that servicing issue. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you. I, I think the interesting thing is we talk about this going out to the public. And I think Councillor Jago said the nail on the head. This is already in the public's eyes. <laughs> Everything that's been done and, and a draft OPA is right now in front of the public. Um, there's nothing hidden. Um, so the public is already starting to provide comment. And I think we're going to hear is servicing appropriate or not, is density appropriate or not, is residential appropriate or not. Um, at the same time, the district is also going to provide their comment. Is it appropriate? Is it not appropriate? All of this in advance of any of us making any recommendations or decisions. So it's strictly soliciting input. I see Councillor Roberts has got his hand up. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair, Mr. Mayor there. Um, I'm on... This is a, a document that was prepared, produced with a lot of thought by um, a well knowledge group. But there's seven councillors that have not really put their uh, thoughts forward on what should happen in Minette. So this is, I think, I support, I know, I, and I think I would like, I support Councillor Jaguas. We need to have a separate meeting as soon as we can that puts um, uh, the Township of Muskoka Lakes stamp or thoughts into this OPA before it goes out to the public. Um, my other thought is that uh, building on what Councillor Kelly has said, we got to think outside the bubble when it comes to public meetings. There's a lot of people that don't have the skill or have never uh, uh, been on the internet to uh, use Zoom. So it should be something like we see in Home Depot or when I go to a doctor's office. When I go to a doctor's office, I sit in a car. When it's my turn, they call me. I go into the, into the office, I'm the only one there and I'm in a bubble. And we could do the same thing with our public that wants to speak. They could sit out in the car and they could come into council at the one end and create a bubble just for them so they can present and that gives everyone the opportunity to speak. That's all I have to say. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, and, I, and I do know whatever form of public meeting this goes forward with between us and the district, that the public will have every opportunity to voice their concerns. Um, in the absence of Zoom technology, let's be honest, people who live in Europe or live in the US and may wanna have a comment have never been able to comment. The fact that they could Zoom into a meeting today we've actually increased our transparency. We've increased the ability for someone to provide public comment. And I also know, um, as we all know, we're also bombarded regularly with emails with people's opinions and comments on whatever the topic is. You got a supplemental, Council Roberts? Just waiting for mute. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, I'm not, I think it's fantastic. We now have Zoom technologies that we can hear worldwide comments. I'm just thinking of the uh, people, the, the permanent people within uh, Manette, within our township that may not have the technology, let alone the bandwidth to, to speak. So I'm just looking for an, another option. Oh, really noted, thank you. Uh, anyone else wanna comment at this particular point? I have another interesting idea and, and sort of I'm trying to get a, a sense of uh, where council is. I think generally we know that the draft as we see it right now is already in the public. People have commented on it as Councillor Jagowitz and represented many, many people. The world hasn't. Um, we do not endorse this. We don't say this is what should be, but I think what's going forward is that we are trying to solicit additional comment. What I do believe is that uh, I'm not sure all of council, because I think Councillor Roberts made the comment, you know, we've had three councillors who've had an opportunity to understand more in depth and what some of the policies mean, some of the zoning, what it really looks like. Um, and I think uh, Paula is still on the call and, and maybe council can help me here because I've been to a couple presentations through the Minette Steering Committee um, and at the district level, but I don't believe that uh, Paula and Mr. Goldhar have ever actually presented their concept plans to our council in particular. Anybody differing on that? And it may be my seniors moment, uh, but I don't believe they've ever actually come to us. So what I'm thinking is in a... Um, 
uh, Manette OPA 101, what's out there, uh, that in this special planning meeting, there's some discussion about that and that maybe we also kick off that meeting a little bit with some of uh, Mr. Goldhar's concepts as to what he does, because Councillor Jagowitz brought that forward, that he saw one thing, now maybe this is slightly different, um, and just that we make sure his concept, uh, where it's going forward, we have a better idea, because um, numbers are, are numbers on pages, and until we actually see what's really kind of going forward, it's sometimes difficult, so I think that may help us all understand a little bit more. Councillor Jagowitz, you want to comment? Uh, yes, I did. I, uh, I understand there is a concept plan that has been floating around, but I would caution you, Mr. Mayor, that um, a concept plan, uh, when you look at pictures, doesn't necessarily reflect the OPA. And, and let me give you one example. I've seen that concept plan, and it shows a hotel, yet the OPA does not mention a hotel. So, so, so concept plans are dangerous. I, I think we should be sticking to the OPA, uh, to what we're actually going to authorize. And that was one of the things I wanted to bring up. If we want a hotel, and if that's what's in the concept plan, then the OPA should be amended to talk about a hotel and what size it should be and so on. So I think we have to be uh, a bit cautious on that. I, I, I think I take the what uh, a lot of our presenters have said today, this is really up to us now. I, I, I think we've, we've heard enough and I think we, we have to get down and, and discuss it. And then if as a group, we feel there's something missing and we wanna bring the parties back for information, we can do that, but we can always do that through staff too. Okay, um, I do appreciate that. I think that uh, I, I'm gonna suggest the developer if there's some inconsistencies right now as noted by uh, Mr. Jagowitz, between uh, a concept of a hotel and not, uh, that they do need to be reflected appropriately in uh, the OPA. And I see Paula's turned on her camera. Maybe Paula, you wanna to speak to it and maybe can help answer. I think it may be a good question answer perspective because um, there's different zones and different densities and, and what truly the vision is within. Um, so we understand the difference between residential or residential rental unit or whatever to help uh, and I think that's the education for our council to fully understand. Well, uh, no, no, absolutely. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the hotel is a permitted use in the OPA. So, um, uh, uh, Councillor Jagowitz, I'm not totally sure what you're referring to and you're saying it's not in the OPA, but it is a, a permitted use in the OPA. Uh, the residential, obviously, is, is one of the contentious components here. I, I think um, we've always presented as far back as when we presented to the steering committee last fall that the predominant use here is going to be a commercial resort based development, but we always want to reserve the right to do some modest residential in conjunction with it. And that's been a consistent position that we've taken from uh, the time that we met with the steering committee last fall. Um, so there are obviously a lot of restrictions and a lot of what I'm calling bookends and controls that have been put in place that never existed previously with the property, including, as we said, kind of GFA caps, unit definitions, use restrictions, a lot of things that in totality have to be looked at and really would kind of curb development and put a lot of restrictions on how the development could be phased and, and built out. So that's, I guess, the one point that we are just trying to make that if residential is incorporated, it will be done in a responsible way and done again in the totality of all the different uh, uh, policy permissions and policy restrictions that are being proposed. So, uh, but hotel absolutely is, is a permitted use in the documentation and, and that is something that we absolutely are, are looking at. Uh, thank you. I see Councillor Jagowicz, your hand is up and uh, over to you. Yes, and I, I really don't want to get into a back and forth and that's not my intention. Yes, I knew the hotel was a permitted use, but I don't see it as a required use. And I would just point out in our history, and that's before my time, there was another developer that wanted to, to uh, develop a hotel and condo situation. I think a lot of you know who I mean and they went forward with the condos and never did the hotel. And so, so there's, a lot of, there's a lot of issues there. I, I just think this needs, uh, this needs a lot of thought. Um, the other thing is that this is at the OP stage and uh, we still have the zoning to go through. So there's, there's lots, but um, I, I, know, I know I'm stuttering here because Paul, I, I do respect what you're trying to do. I, I really do. I just think that um, 
our council, at least the seven of us that weren't uh, in all the details, we need time to talk amongst ourselves and try to develop what we see the area. And that's what I think that's the right thing to do. And we may very well come around to exactly what you presented. That may, that may be the end result. And I think we kind of have to do that before we go out to the public in a formal, in a formal set. Yeah. I'll, I'll leave my comments at that for today. Thank you. Uh, anybody else have any other comments at this particular time? Uh, Councillor Edwards. Yes, you know, uh, see, seeing uh, in that concept drawings, uh, I think would help the uh, public an awful lot uh, in that. And one of the things um, I'd like to see is, is there going to be any public beach? You're talking about all these residents in, in behind. Where are they going to go to swim and, and, and actually enjoy the water? Is there going to be anything uh, in that? I haven't seen anything on that yet. And uh, it, it's just a uh, question because you can't put all these houses there and then where are they going to go to swim? Do they have to go down to Hannes Park or somewhere like that uh, to, to, to find the beach? So, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think I'd, I'd like to see a, a layout of, of, of what they're actually going to uh, do there. Okay. Um... Councillor Hayes. Yeah, a lot of work has gone in to this, um, but something that um, Mr. Pink said that we wanted to make, wanted to bring forward our position. And I don't know if, if this draft is my position yet. I still um, feel that we have to go through one more meeting. So I would have no problem with bringing this forward as a draft to um, the district and we'll have a follow-up meeting and bring the results of that meeting out to the public as what council has put forward. Because I think if we bring it out now to the public as the draft, um, it's assumed that we have endorsed it. This is the endorsed draft. So I just want to make sure that that is known that we have not endorsed this. This is the Manette steering group um, or the working group draft policy. So I'll, I'll further a little bit because I mean, as much as there was some discussion in the working group, um, as stated in the consultants report, there still wasn't even consensus. And this is the consultants recommendation going forward for public comment. So um, <laughs> no, nobody says this is exactly what I want. I can, I can, can probably suggest not to put words in Councillor Bridgman or Edwards uh, mouth, but uh, this isn't exactly what I would want going forward. But is it something that I'm happy to get some public input on? I think that's a, a yes, because I don't know where the public's going to end up. But um, I, I'm getting a sense, you know, the resolution that's before us that talks about uh, that draft official plan amendment, and, and we, we call it draft, um, be circulated. Again, it's already circulated by our amendment or by our policy. It's out there in the public at present. And um, no, we're not doing a circulation to all the particular homeowners and stakeholders within the village of Manette. But let's be honest, I don't think there's anybody in Manette that's probably not tuning in to watch this right now um, and or having uh, comments made back and forth with people. So um, I think the big issue is, do we want to go out at one point with something like this or an amended version uh, to get more and more public input with the district and keep this process moving on? Uh, I think the one thing we've talked about is a work back, trying to get this uh, done this fall before Christmas, if you will, so that there's something on the books in November. And uh, you work that back. We need to kind of continue to get more and more input before we get council's perspective on what we recommend in an OPA. Um, so, Councillor Zavich, you want to comment quickly? Thank you, Mayor. Th through you, I, I want to you know, sort of echo your comments, except the point that if uh, the public is so well educated, um, why are we still having so many questions of such concern? I, I got to be honest, uh, and I'm only going to be that way. Um, if we as council have all this information in front of us, and I'm hearing about the seven who, who haven't, you know, been as close to it, uh, I, I can't see that we would want to send out to the public a confusing message 
when the public is watching us here and now and realize that we are confused. I, I, I hate to use the word confused, but at the very least, there's, there's such an overabundance of information uh, that we'll say, hey, listen, while we're still pondering this because we don't know what we, where we really stand on it, uh, we're gonna let you public have a look at it and you tell us. I mean, you, you talk about, um, you know, what are, we, what are we to do? I heard Councillor Jaglowitz earlier say, you know, it's 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 time. I'm ready to format this thing and send. I don't know what we're really going to send out. And I I would cha challenge. Us. I'm not going to support if any kind of voting. To, I'm not going to support anything that sends us out to the public until we, the council, has that meeting, that planning um, session, that that chat one more time. Everyone else has had more than ample opportunity. I see no reason to rush this now. Okay, what I'm sensing from Council is that uh, we're not going to send anything anywhere, so technically it's out there. Uh, we're not endorsing anything today, uh, which no one was asked to endorse anything today, um, but we're also not ready to ask for public input on this document, is what I'm sort of sensing, and so things don't fail. Uh, I, I'm going to ask at this point maybe if Council can sort of have a look at some calendars and uh, to try and meet the because I, I don't believe we should be waiting a month and then getting to the district in October because we will be into the new year before this happens. And if you remember, this was a priority back, we started discussing this back November, December of 2019 as to how to get an official plan amendment on the books. So COVID hit, we've had some great working groups with everybody, um, but uh, I, I'm gonna recommend right now, looking at a calendar, I don't think there's any meetings on Tuesday, September 15th that we call a special and, and because if we have to go to planning committee and then to council, whatever, we'll just go to a special uh, meeting of council so we can endorse at the end of the day. It's all still 10 of us. And we move that uh, look for um, some more input into this. We've all had a couple of weeks to digest the information. Everybody's uh, uh, reports to us. And I'm sure that we will get more public comment between now and then as well. Um, Councilor Nishikawa. Thank you. I'm I'm a little bit concerned that we are we are just asked to check our schedules and and quickly a, a date was chosen, and uh, I would say that I would not be able to attend that meeting. Some of us still have jobs, uh, and that is not a, a day that because I've also had to block out three or four other days of that week for uh, council meetings or planning meetings. Um, I, the, the, the whole idea, the, this whole concept of keep ramming meetings and us being actually fulsome in our discussions is very concerning to me. And what I heard was that we are trying to get all of this through because we're afraid of a developer coming forward with an application, which has happened to us in the past. I thought I got the impression that we were working with this developer. Um, so I, I'm not in favor of trying to rush this thing. Um, oh, but if the rest of the council wants to do that, I just can't take, I can't partake because I didn't, I'm not full time. I'm not on council full time. I still have a business to run. And so please respect that when you're choosing dates. Thank you. And, and duly noted, and trust me, I, I am the same person that uh, uh, have to uh, sacrifice uh, at times and uh, can't be at every single meeting. Um, so I know that I threw it out there as a date ahead. We, we could do this in our next council meeting, theoretically, and um, which is a date that's already blocked on the Wednesday of that day. Um, if I just heard that people wanted a special meeting to debate and discuss this in its entirety, but, um, you know, we can, uh, try and go directly with our council meeting that day, maybe a little bit longer day, but, um, I'm open, uh, for council's comments. Councilor Bridgman, you wanted to comment? Uh, thank you, Mayor Harding. I have difficulty with, with the first date that you, that you suggested, okay. um, uh, but, um, Unlike Councillor Nishikawa, I would like to see this start to move forward. I believe we have the information we need 
to start to move this forward. So I might suggest the 10th or 11th of September. I think kids are back in school by then, et cetera, et cetera. It's the week before, it's a heavy planning. It is a heavy meeting week the next week for all of us. So I would suggest the 10th or 11th because I still would like to have this before district meets. That would be my goal. Okay, we might have, uh, again, we're trying to force a meeting uh, or potentially an extra meeting within the next two weeks, um, which we may not be able to land today. We may be able to help to send out a, a doodle poll to see when people can uh, meet and some options from our planning staff because they've also got a number of other things to get organized for that Friday. I know prior uh, is also a super busy time for staff as they get agendas prepared to get out for council the following week. Uh, Councillor Everts. Uh, I would like to have a special meeting for this. I don't think we can wrap it in with, with uh, council because it just gets gets wrapped up. Uh, and the week before the 10th or 11th would, would probably suit me better because I've got committee of adjustment on, uh, the, on, on the Monday, the 14th, and we've got uh, meetings I've got to read just about all weekend anyway for it. Uh, and that's so I would like to see it a little bit sooner. Uh, I would support uh, and that chair uh, Bridgman having it either the 10th or the 11th. Okay. Um, I think we should we should be be uh, discussing this, uh, uh, and that it should be a special meeting at some point. Okay. Understood. Anybody else want to chime in? Uh, what I what I'm sensing again is that we may uh, have our uh, planning staff send out a, a doodle poll just to double check if the uh, Thursday or Friday of that week um, is appropriate. I know Councilor Mishikawa may have some issues with that. Um, and unfortunately, as soon as we break from any kind of a, a regular routine, uh, any one of us may at times have issues, um, which is understood because this is not a full-time job for anyone around this uh, table, certainly. So um, appreciated. Um, Council, are you okay with uh, a doodle poll going out on the Thursday or Friday and to get it so uh, confirmation? Getting a sense and a nodding of heads. Okay, so Mr. Pink. Madam Deputy Clerk, we're not going to uh, read this resolution today. We're going to leave that for a uh, special time and a special place. Um, and uh, I do appreciate uh, everybody's help. Uh, appreciate, again, all of the uh, comments and uh, information we received from the general public today. Uh, we can all digest those and uh, determine uh, what potentially needs to change, evolve, um, or is that just more public comment on something that's being floated out there with the public? And then we get to really chime in and say we agree or we disagree. And that's uh, our role as council. So um, also, I, I'm also got a sense that generally uh, it would be a good education for council to get a better idea of the developer's ideas and high level concepts within Cleveland's House. Uh, so we understand really where they're going. Um, because sometimes uh, numbers are numbers on paper um, or whatever. And if, again, a hotel is contemplated, that's why it's obviously within the uh, OP. That's not specified, but we don't specify housing, but it's contemplated that it's allowed. So um, anyway, Councillor Jagowitz, you want to comment? Uh, yes, I, uh, it wasn't on that particular uh, point, but similar. I wonder if it mightn't hurt at that meeting that we're going to schedule to invite uh, Commissioner Yan to, uh, from the district possibly to address us uh, with his thoughts on the servicing aspect. I, it might be a little bit premature, I think, to bring Commissioner Yan into it. Um, I'm sure that uh, Commissioner Hastings or Acting CAO Hastings at this particular point has obviously seen this draft. There'll be some discussion initially going on from a district perspective. And I think it really would become a, a true district discussion when it hits the uh, district uh, community and planning services table. Um, they may all die at that point. Councillor Everts? Yes, I don't know if, if uh, Paul is still with us, but uh, I'd like to see see the report that, uh, and that the, they had said that they've, they've done this in other areas and it is working. Uh, and that, that would give us a little bit of ammunition. That's what I had asked for. And I'd like to have them send it to, to uh, and that Mr. Pink, and then he can uh, actually distribute it out. But I think we should have that long before our, our, our next meeting. It would certainly be helpful. 
well, I understand that. Just some history. I think of. I think there was some comments about some uh, private servicing in residential yeah. areas. Some. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Just to be clear, I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding. I, I don't think we ever stated that we've done private servicing elsewhere, but we we have uh, commissioned a report uh, being done yeah. by here you know, where we've looked at uh, obviously this issue. So we will uh, we'll get that uh, updated and circulated for for review. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. You're Anybody else? Okay, so uh, as some next steps, we're gonna plan a meeting potentially the 10th or 11th, or 11th or 12th, out of my book, hang on a second here. Not the 12th, let's not do the 12th, correct. Uh, the uh, 10th or the 11th of September, and we'll send out a doodle poll to get uh, the most uh, amenable to council. And uh, I do appreciate everyone. And as I say, I do appreciate uh, developers' concepts and uh, input to working towards this. And also those people from uh, the Minute Joint Steering Committee, Mr. Lewis, uh, Mr. Newell, uh, as we've worked to find some compromise and try and get a, uh, an appropriate landing place for the public. Um, and who knows, come next week, we may not make any changes to the OP uh, as presented, but just continue to solicit uh, more input from the public. So. Um, what's going to happen, I think, in the next 10 days, we're all going to get more and more educated on what's going on in Manette, so that's a good thing. So, seeing that, I have a resolution right now, and that uh, is moved by Councillor Bridgman, seconded by uh, Councillor Evers, be resolved that bylaw 2020-73 to confirm the proceedings of special counsel be read a first, second, and third time, and finally passed. All those in favour? Looks like everybody. Thank you. I have one more moved uh, by Councillor Hayes, seconded by Councillor Jankowitz. Be it resolved that this meeting adjourn at 11.45 a.m. Anyone comments? All those in favor? Once again, that is passed unanimously. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. And uh, we will get out some information for our next meeting. Thank you.